Hello everyone, and welcome back to another video where we are going to be complex analysising this integral from Math 505, and this is kind of a quirky one, I will be honest. Uh, so let's just jump right into it and kind of simplify things a little. So you'll notice we have this cosine term right here, and one way we can write cosine, as you might be familiar, it's just as the real part of e uh, to theta i. But our theta in this case, our argument, is just 1 over x squared plus 1, meaning that this, our cosine term right here is just the real part of e to the i over x squared plus 1 right here. So one way we can rewrite our integral then is just as the real part of the integral over all real numbers. I'm just going to write it like this of e to the x plus i over x squared plus 1. Uh, let me move that e down a little bit, actually. I don't want to get confused, or confuse the viewers, I should say. Um, and then our denominator has not changed. It's still just x squared plus 1. And you'll notice just a couple of things here. Firstly, that, well, we have a pole at, or well, we have two poles, actually. We have poles at x equals i and also negative i. But one thing that is also quite fishy about this integral is that this um, exponent that we're raising e to, this x plus i over x squared plus 1, because we know we can factor x squared plus 1, x squared plus 1, it's just equal to x plus i times x minus i. So one way we can rewrite this to remove this uh, discontinuity at uh, negative i, at least, is just by canceling our terms. We have x plus i over x plus i, x minus i. So, you know, we just cancel those terms right there, and we're left with 1 over x minus i right here. So let me just rewrite our integral as that real quick. Uh, still the real part, of course. Uh, and we're integrating over all real numbers. We haven't done a use of or anything. 1 over x minus i over x squared plus 1. And this is where the quirkiness sort of begins, because whenever we plug in, or I guess take the limit, as x approaches i, we get something a bit funky. We're going to get a 0 down here, right? Because that's one of our poles. But another thing we're going to get is something very strange in the numerator right here. And instead of diving into that, which I probably should at some point, just kind of on the side, Say I want to just avoid that altogether when integrating. So what we would do normally, say, in, in this instance, like if we just were to ignore that e term completely, what we would have is just, you know, if we you know, use complex analysis, it's just this normal semicircular contour where the top bar is in you know the top half of the complex plane. But because I don't really want to deal with this 1 over x minus i, this, uh, I think it's called an essential singularity, uh, at x equals i, what I'm going to do instead actually is, I mean, <laughs> it's like kind of the first time I've done this, like, for a reason, is integrate over this contour right here, the negative version of uh, the, the original one, where instead of our semicircle being in the top half of the complex plane, it's now in the bottom half. And this right here is really just to avoid uh, having to deal with that right there. And as such, what we can do, uh, and we're integrating over this direction right here, uh, because we still want our integral to go in that direct, uh, that way, from left to right, uh, negative to positive. So what this means in terms of the residue theorem is, then, uh, I'll actually label our two contours right here that make up this big one. Uh, we can just apply the residue theorem here, actually. So in doing so, we find that our closed line integral over the entire thing well, when deconstructed, is equal to our integral over gamma 1 plus our integral over gamma 2. Uh, <clears throat> left as an exercise to the reader, that's 0. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can just do that with Jordan Slana, maybe. But it's 0. Take my word for it, please. Uh, but this right here, the integral over gamma 1, is just going to be equal to i right here, uh, where i is just going to be this, our integral right there. And again, by the residue theorem, this is just going to be Normally, it would be 2 pi i times the residues, but we have to note one very important thing. We are not integrating 
uh, counterclockwise anymore. We are going in a clockwise direction now, meaning that instead of 2 pi i, it's going to be negative 2 pi i times the sum of our residues. Uh, and we only have uh, one pole in here, actually, and that's just going to be at uh, x equals negative i. So the residue at negative i. So with that out of the way, let's actually calculate uh, this residue, shall we? The residue at i is going to be equal to this is just by the residue theorem, the limit as x approaches negative i of x plus i over x squared plus 1 times e to the 1 over x minus i right here. And this really is not a bad limit to evaluate at all. Uh, we're just going to cancel some stuff here. So this just gives us a 1 over x minus i times e to the 1 over x minus i. And we still have the limit as x approaches negative i. And just plugging and chugging, this gives us 1 over negative 2i times e to the 1 over negative 2i. So if we were to multiply both sides, or not both sides, just multiply by 2 pi i to find our residue, what we find then is our residue is equal to 2 pi i, or sorry, negative 2 pi i over negative 2i times e to the i over 2, and this just comes from the fact uh, that i equals 1 over negative i. Fun fact for you. And simplifying this even further, we find that... Oh, sorry, this actually isn't our residue. I do apologize. Uh, our, our integral. Sorry. Our integral is equal to 2 pi i times negative 2 pi i times our residue. Uh, but yes, simplifying this, we find that the negatives cancel, the 2s cancel, and the i's cancel, leaving us with pi times e to the i over 2. So, what did we want to find originally? We wanted to find, kind of moving on up here, we wanted to find the real part of this. We've evaluated our integral, but we want the real part of it. Meaning that if we just have to take the real part of pi e to the i over 2, that's really not so bad because e to the i over 2 is just equal to, by Euler's identity, cosine of 1 half plus i sine of 1 half meaning that our integral is equal to pi times the cosine of one-half. And that right there is our answer. It also should be noted that you can find the same integral, but with sine, actually. Uh, because, I mean, notice we used e right here. So if you were to take the imaginary part of this integral, uh, you'd get the same thing, but with just pi times sine of one-half. Uh, and you'd still get you know, a real number and everything. Um, so yeah, just two kind of similar integrals that can be evaluated this way. But yes, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please check out Math 505 original video they posted a little while ago. And yeah, thank you for watching.